Well, good morning, BSFBC. We would love to welcome you to Online Church. Right now, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, or the website, we are one body of believers, and we are excited to join together as a church family. Uh, I'm your online host. My name is Grayson Galloway, and I'm one of the pastors here at BSFBC. And I believe that today, God has something to show us. I believe that today, God has something to show you. Um, but right now, what we want to do is before we get started we're our, with our service, you can like this video, you can comment below, you can share it with your friends. It's easier than ever right now to invite your friends to church with you today. Uh, and in a time right now where we're separated, we want to help keep you connected. And one way that we can do that is through our online connection class groups, whether they meet through Zoom or other formats, you can shoot us an email if you want to jump in with us at connect at bsfbc.org. Well, thanks so much again for being here with us this morning online. And at this time, please join us for worship. Good morning, church, from your homes and your living rooms. Join us as we sing about the great things Christ is doing. bow at his feet he has done great things see what our Savior has done and see how his love overcomes he has done great things he has done great things oh hero of heaven you
I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never Verses 7 through 12 says this. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. 
The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. God, there is no escaping of your presence. There is, as your children, there is no, no road that we can walk on too far that goes out of your grasp. God, in, when, when it seems like we are enveloped in darkness, your light is stronger and brighter than that darkness. So God, we just depend on you. We thank you that your right hand is so strong and that we will not be able to fall from your grasp as your children. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
your presence is here. And we thank you that it's a never forsaking, never leaving presence. In Jesus' name, amen. What an incredible time of worship we've already had this morning. We are so blessed with our worship pastors here at Bowen Springs First Baptist Church, but I just want to challenge you with this. Worship isn't over. Right now, you can continue to worship through your giving, and we've made it easier than ever for you to give. There are three ways for you to give right now from wherever you are. The first is you can give online at bsfbc.org slash give. You can also text any amount to 864-412-0914, or you can mail or drop off your tithes and offerings during normal business hours. Well, church family, let us know that you're here. Again, like, share, comment below, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, and stay tuned as we continue our series in John. Hey, Boiling Springs family, once again, I want to thank you for watching, for joining us online. You've been so faithful, and we've been so encouraged hearing from you hearing how God's working in your lives. We have a number of people to come to know the Lord as their Savior and just so much encouragement. So thanks for being with us again in this online service. You know, we've just witnessed over the last few days the first virtual NFL draft. How crazy is that? Who would have imagined that we would ever experience something like that as a result of the coronavirus and this global impact? Uh, and, you know, I thought it was cool that they were trying to really focus on one word, hope that somehow watching something that w would give people hope and excitement and give a picture of some sense of hope of normalcy down there, down the road in the future, uh, that word hope was so important. And yet I just want to say to us this morning as we gather around the word of God that real hope, true hope, hope of life is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and God's word. And we're going to revisit that conversation that Jesus was having with Nicodemus as it continues here in verses 16 through 21 of John chapter 3. So kind of turn there in your Bibles, if you will, make your way to that. But I thought about uh, Joe Burrow being the number one draft pick, Heisman Trophy winner, having won, of course, the national championship with LSU. But it made me think of Tim Tebow back in 2009. He also was a Heisman Trophy winner. He also won a national championship against Oklahoma when he was playing for Florida, and he was a first-round draft pick. But before that game, I believe it was January 8th, 2009, before the national championship game, the night before, he went to Coach Meyer. He had been having uh, this black underneath his eyes with the, the, the verse Philippians 4.13, we can do all, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that had been with him for over a year. And Coach Meyer was a guy of routine and, and those rituals and not changing. If it's not broken, don't fix it. So stay with it. And so Tim Tebow said he went to Coach Meyer the night before the national championship. And he said, Coach, I really feel like the Lord has moved on my heart to change my verse. And Coach Meyer kind of freaked out. No, man, we've been, that's what got us where we are. And, of course, Tim Tebow said, well, football got us where we are too, right? And uh, then Coach Meyer said, okay, it's okay. And so that next day in the national championship game, in the, under the black under his eyes, Tim Tebow had the scripture, John 3, 16. A couple days after the national championship, which they beat Oklahoma, he was sitting with Coach Meyer and his family in a restaurant. He got a call from a PR guy for the Gators, and he said, you're not going to believe this, Coach. But he said, during that game, the national championship game, there were 94 million people who Googled John 3, 16. Three years later, Tebow tells the story. It was January the 10th, 2012. He's now playing with the Denver Broncos as a quarterback. The starting quarterback has been injured, and so he's leading the team against the Pittsburgh Steelers in this AFC wildcard game. Three years later, and it was a crazy game, and he actually – it was a stunning victory that he, they won. The Broncos won in overtime. Tebow threw a first play of overtime through a pass, touchdown pass, and the Broncos won, beat the Steelers. He's on his way to the press conference after the game, and the PR guy for the Broncos said, Timmy, do you know what happened? He said, yeah, we just won the wild card game, man. We're going to play New England after this. And he said, no, do you, you realize what happened? He said, you, you, you're John 316. He said, you threw for 300 and 16 yards exactly. He said the average yards per completion was 31.6. He said we controlled the ball for 31 minutes and 6 seconds. He said the rating, the TV rating, Timmy, was 31.6. And he said during the game, Tim, 
He said 90 million people. It was the number one Google search in the world. 90 million people Googled John 3.16. Isn't that incredible to think about? This is certainly the most known verse in all of the world. It's the Bible in one verse, the gospel in a nutshell. Way before Tim Tebow, the, uh, the Egyptians sent to England, to the British in 1878, an obelisk, which is, it was called Cleopatra's Needle. It's like the Washington Monument, that tall, narrow, with sort of a pyramid top. They sent as a gift to the British that was this ancient obelisk that had been in Egypt and uh, they were going to place it there, the British, beside the Thames River in London. But before they uh, sat it erect, they placed in the base of that obelisk, they placed a time capsule. What do you put in a time capsule, right? You put things that matter, things that you want people to remember, things that you want people, future generations to know. If whatever time that Britain goes or England goes the way of all ancient civilizations, that somebody might look at this time capsule and it might kind of let them know what was important and who these people were. And so in that time capsule, they put current currency. They put the money of that day. They put the t- pictures of the 10 most beautiful women in the world in that time capsule. They put some children's toys in that time capsule. It was also kind of interesting. I have no idea, but they put a man's razor in that time capsule beneath, beneath that obelisk in the foundation of it. And then they put one verse of the Bible, John three sixteen translated 215 different languages that was the at that time the number of known languages around the world they wanted one verse that would capture the bible in every language john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life and so i want you to see as we move now to john chapter 3 remember we finished verse 15 and Jesus is speaking, John, uh, Nicodemus, this Pharisee, this chief teacher of Israel, comes to Jesus at night, and Jesus engages in this gospel conversation. And we see that, that uh, Jesus is saying in verse 15 that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And then the first word of verse 16 is a conjunction, for. And really, verse 16 answers verse 15. So verse 15 quarter of leaves us with that why question of why would Jesus allow us or want us to have eternal life? Why would God want us to have eternal life? For God so loved the world. And so I want you to see that the, the gospel is first and foremost a mission of love, the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. There are three words in the Greek for that word love. The word, one is eros, the word we get erotic from. It's interesting that that word is not mentioned. It's not listed one time in the New Testament. It is in the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament. The second word is philadelphos. It's the word, the name for Philadelphia, brotherly love. It's used many times in the New Testament. And it speaks of our love as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and the, the wonderful deep bond of love that we have in Jesus. And then the word that's used here for the first time in the Gospel of John is the word agape. It's used the first time, but it's used, John uses it 36 times. It more than any other book in the New Testament. This word agape is the word for love here. It means sacrificial love. It means self-giving love. It's the love of God. And listen, this word love is the main verb in this entire section of scripture. For God so loved. The gospel Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is a, is a mission of love from God to you through me, his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so I, I love the passage in Ephesians chapter three, verses 17 through 19. Paul talks about that love as well. And he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Paul said, I want you to be able to comprehend with all of the saints, all of the brothers and sisters, what kind of love it is that Jesus has, that God has for us. And so really in Ephesians chapter three, Paul asked these questions, what what are the dimensions of this love? 
John 3, 16 answers that question. So let's look at that. First of all, Paul says, how wide? What is the breadth? What is the width of the love of God? How wide is God's love? John 3, 16 answers that by saying, for God so loved, direct object of love is the world. How wide is God's love? That word world is cosmos. It means for every person on the planet, for the whole world, not for a select few. God loves every person who's ever lived, the inhabited world, every individual. As we said, a core gospel value last week is that God loves everyone. The gospel is for everyone. And so how wide is his love? It reaches to every person, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. Here's what I want you to hear. God loves you so much. And then he says, Paul says, how, how, what is the length of God's love? How long is God's love? John 3, 16 answers that as well when it says his love is eternal. See there at the end, you could circle that phrase, eternal life, there in verse 15 and verse 16. We see that is a key in the gospel of John. His love has no beginning. It has no end. Here's what I want you to see. His love lasts forever. God's love will never fail you. It will never run out. It will never not be enough. God's love is that you may know the fullness of, the, of God and, and uh, you may come to understand how long he loves you from the beginning of time to the end of time. It's eternal. His love is eternal. I saw a story that happened just a few weeks ago, Easter week. A pastor, Pastor Duggins down in Texas, preached on Easter Sunday. He had just two months prior to that lost his wife of 59 years. He had really walked with her as her primary giver through over a decade of cancer. He loved her so dearly. And he lamented, even in that message, that I, he said, I have to be honest, I wanted to die with my wife. When she died, really so much of me died because we were one. It was a beautiful love story. Two months after his wife died, he preached the gospel on Easter Sunday. Shortly after the service, he had a heart attack and he died. It's a beautiful picture of love that lasted a lifetime. 59 plus years, he loved his wife. Can I tell you about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ? It not only lasts a lifetime, it lasts for all eternity. How long is the love of God? Forever. His love lasts forever. And that is an incredible love. And then, Paul says in Ephesians, how how high is the love of God? What is the height? I want you to understand, comprehend. He says, what is the height of the love of Christ, the love of God? John 3, 16 answers that as well. He says, the love of God is as high as the heavens. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only, his only begotten son. Where did Jesus come from? Listen, love, this mission of love, the gospel began in the heart of God in heaven. And it's a picture of the highest degree of love, of perfect love, of pure love, of a love that is the highest love, the one-of-a-kind love of God. As a matter of fact, Psalm chapter 103, verse 11 says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so, so great is the love of the Father of those who fear him, those who seek him. God's love is the highest love. It is perfect love. And then Paul in Ephesians chapter three, verse 18 says, How deep? What is the depth? I want you to know the depth of the love of Jesus, the depth of the love of God. John 3, 16 again answers that question. How deep is the love of God? For God so loved the world that he gave. It's a gave. It's a purpose clause. It's a henna clause in the Greek. That means it's not just some ambiguous statement. It is specific. He loved you so much that he gave himself. He gave his only son. I want you to see that the love of God is so deep that his love is all in. It means that God gave his son fully from heaven. He gave his son in birth. He gave his son in his life. He gave his son on the cross. He gave his son in his death. He gave his son. He in totality has given us the gift of his son. It also means that he gave this one of a kind gift, this gift that no one else could ever give. It's a love that has given a gift that only God could give. The word for only begotten is monogenes in the, in the Greek. Mono meaning singular, one. Genes is our word genetic. In, in one gene, he, he gave himself, he's all in, but he gave this one of a kind, unique love. 
this gift of love in his only son. No one has ever given that kind of a gift, that great of a gift of the love of God as he gave in giving his son. No gift has ever been given to humanity that can ever be like that is the greatest gift, the greatest love ever given. God gave out of the depth of his love, his one and only son. It means to give sacrificially. It means I love you more than I care about you, more than I care about myself. It's a self-giving, sacrificial love, this agape love. The depth of his love is that he would give his one and only son that we might have eternal life in him. Uh, F.M. Uh, F. M. Lanier wrote the song, The Love of God. It's an amazing hymn in our, by, in our hymn books. But the origination of that song by F.M. Lehman was that he had lost his job. He was living in Pasadena, California. It was really hard times for he and his family. And uh, he was in hard labor doing, working in a manufacturing plant, putting oranges and apples in boxes and just this mundane sort of daily grind. But he was so amazed and so uh, in, in incredibly blessed by the love of God. Even sitting there working, he began to think about these lyrics to that great hymn. And he wrote the first two stanzas of that great hymn, The Love of God. The love of God is rich and pure. How measureless and strong that beautiful hymn. But the last verse, the last stanza of that hymn, The Love of God, was not original to him. As a matter of fact, it was anonymously written by someone that after this person passed away, it was discovered that these words had been scrawled on the wall of a mental institution where this person was. Think about that in the state of being mentally disturbed and mentally at a place of depression and the depths of that agony of that person existing in that mental institution. God so disclosed his love. God shed his love. God expressed his love that that person in that moment was able to grasp it and pen these beautiful words and scrawl them in handwriting on the wall. And they found that. And somebody wrote that down. And, and uh, he had, Lehman, had found those words and had them. And so he wrote that as the third stanza for that hymn. And it goes like this. Here's the third stanza, the love of God written on that wall in that insane asylum, that mental institution. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made where every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. What an incredible picture of the exhaustless, the measureless love of God. It's interesting that actually they found out that originally those words were not from that person in the mental institution, but they originated in the 11th century from a rabbi. And I just imagine that rabbi, that Jewish rabbi, standing on those very shores where we were at not long ago as we went to Israel, there on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Imagine that rabbi looking out, think about the love of Jehovah. If the whole Mediterranean Sea were ink, and every stalk were a quill, and we could, the parchment of the sky was something we could write on, that we could drain the oceans dry because we wouldn't have enough ink to write it. The skies could not to contain the whole of the love of God. Imagine that rabbi in that moment thinking about the love of God. I pray in this moment where there's anxiety, this moment where there's fear, uncertainty, in this moment where it seems like our world is in such chaos and disorder and unstable, that today, the anchor of your soul, today you might find incredible hope in realizing the love of God for you. That his love is so deep and so high and so wide and so long that there's nothing like his love and that that love today might stabilize, might give you hope, might bring you peace, that you would understand the love of God. The millennial generation is known as the most anxious generation in the history of our country. But we're living in a time where anxiety and mental instability and people feel the stress and the strain of all that's happening in our globe, loss of job, and so many things that have been disrupted in our lives. And I just think it's so, inc so important and so beautiful to today that we could hear Jesus say to us like he's saying to Nicodemus, God so loved you, Hank. Would you put your name in the book? God so loves you that he gave his only begotten son, that you, if you would believe in him, would have life and have it eternally in him and not perish, not be destroyed, not be lost forever without him in a real place separated from God in hell. 
but that he desires that you have eternal life. Then I want you to see the gospel is not only a mission of love, but the gospel is really a rescue mission. Look what it says there in verse 17 of John chapter 3. For God, listen, here's what God's mission through Jesus was not. It was not a mission of condemnation. For God did not send his son into the world to judge. I like the word condemn there, some translations say. To judge the world, but that the world through him, the world might be saved through him. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, on a rescue mission to rescue me from myself, to rescue you from yourself, from our sin, from the penalty of the sin, the judgment of that sin, from separation and from perishing. doesn't just mean to die physically. It means to die spiritually, be separated from God for all of eternity. Jesus came on a rescue mission, not a mission of condemnation. How can we receive that rescue? How can we be rescued? Well, look again at John 3, 16. It's another purpose clause we see there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, that word whoever in the Greek is word pos. It means whoever, whatever person, it doesn't matter who you are, how much you've sinned, what part of the world you live in, what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter whoever, that, that any person, every person who believes, there's that word believes, you can circle that word believe. Again, in John's gospel, we see it over and over and over. And here's Jesus saying to Nicodemus, I want you to believe. Nicodemus, if you will believe, you will have eternal life. You will be born again. You will have and know and experience personally this one-of-a-kind love of God through me. That you can be saved, you can be rescued eternally through this great love of Jesus Christ. And so it's a beautiful picture of rescue. And then I want you to see finally, it says there in verse 18 as well, he who believes in him is not judged. We don't receive the condemnation. We don't receive the judgment of our sin. You see, we are condemned because of our sin. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. And the wages or the judgment of that sin is death. God did not come and send his son on a mission of judgment, on condemnation, but to rescue us, to save us. And he who believes in him is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed. And so clearly we can see the way that we're born again, the way that we have eternal life is that we believe. And again, that doesn't mean just mental assent. It means that I fully turn from my sin and trust in Jesus Christ, run in the arms of grace of God, receive the love of God, believe that he is the savior of the world, that he lived and he died for my sin and he rose again. And that I believe with all of my heart and all of my life on all of who he is that the one who believes in him will be saved and will have life. But the one who does not believe, who rejects that, who refuses to come and believe in him, will be separated from God. And then I want you to see, finally, the gospel mandates for each and every one of us who have believed in him, mandates that we live our lives on that same mission. Look what it says there in verses 19 through 21. This is the judgment. I like the word verdict, some translations. This is the verdict. This is the tell of the tape. This is the deal. This is the verdict. That the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Look at verse 21. But he who practices the truth, he who walks in the truth, comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as though having been wrought in God. And so the verdict is this. Those who have believed on Jesus Christ are those who have come to the light. To the light. Here's Jesus again revealing himself to Nicodemus. I think it's so incredible that at the end of this one-on-one conversation, this gospel conversation, Jesus is having with Nicodemus. Remember, Nicodemus comes at night, but that represents the darkness of his own life, his lack of understanding. But what Nicodemus would have known, being a Pharisee, being the chief teacher of Israel, he knew the the Old Testament backwards and forward. He knew the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place in the life of Judaism is the Holy of Holies in the temple or what was in the tabernacle and then in the temple, Solomon's temple. 
It was the most sacred place. It was that place that the veil, that huge heavy curtain would go from the top all the way to the bottom so that no light could come into there to the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And the mercy seat covered the Ark of the Covenant. And once a year, that priest would slip in in that curtain and he would sprinkle the blood on that mercy seat that would atone for the sins of the people. And he would, he would immediately go out. And in that Holy of Holies, in that place of darkness, it's believed that the Shekinah glory, the light of God would shine down and receive that offering of atonement and forgive the sins of the people. Nicodemus would have known that so well, that holy of holies where the light of God would shine. You remember the story in the crucifixion when Jesus breathed his last. It is finished. The telestai. The Bible says the curtain in the temple, Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, from top to bottom was torn in two. And then John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory. Think about this ending of the conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus who's come at night, who's come into the darkness and there is the Shekinah glory of God in person, in the person of Jesus. There, Jesus said, I am the light. He's saying, Nicodemus, come out of the darkness and come into the light. Believe on me and you will have eternal life. And you will have the light of life. You receive light and you can walk in that life. And the verdict is this, that those who come to the light of Jesus Christ will manifest that by walking in the light, by walking in his ways. You can tell who's a follower of Christ because they're manifesting that they've been born again in God through Jesus Christ. They've come to the light and the light of Jesus Christ lives in them. How's that manifest? Because we love people the way that Jesus loves us. What an opportunity for us to love people in Jesus Christ. That's the verdict of our faith, of our belief in Jesus, is that we have, that he lives in us is that we manifest the love of Christ and that we share the story, that we share the gospel, that we have gospel conversations, that we want others to know Jesus. Then it will be made known, it will be manifested that we walk in the light because he is the light of our lives, because we have believed in Jesus. We've been born again because we have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have that? Have you come to the light of Jesus Christ to believe in him? Are you walking in that light? Is that verdict evident that you belong to Jesus because of the life that you're living, walking in his truth, living by the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and his word? There's a story told by William Hull in a book called The Four Dimensions of Love. He tells a story about a, a little boy whose mother died in childbirth. And the family had come to this father this new father of this little infant boy without a mother and said, listen, you can't raise this boy. You need to give this boy to adoption, for, to orphanage or to the social services. And the father, so grieving the death of his wife, uh, relented to do that and gave his son away. And the little boy never saw his father again. All of his life, he yearned to know who his father was, to know the love of his father. But unfortunately, he never knew that. And he just acted out the fact that he was given away, the father, his father gave him away. And, and he was a troubled young man, full with, filled with anger. And so he was just moved from, from orphanage to orphanage and from foster home to foster home. It's a tumultuous young life. And finally landed in a foster home that was out in the country. And this little boy would go out every day and he would climb up a tree and there in a hole in a tree, he would take a little note that he'd rolled into a little scroll and he would stick it into the hole of that tree. He'd go back to his room. And one day those foster parents, when the boy wasn't around, the dad walked out and climbed up that tree and he reached and pulled out one of those notes and he opened it up. They all said the same thing. Whoever finds this, I love you. The little boy wanted so much to know and experience and have and be able to give love that he'd never really understood and known. Can I say to you this morning, Jesus climbed up on a tree and he wrote a note and he said, I love you this much. We ask a little heart, how much do Poppers and Mimi love you? And he puts his arms out as far as he can. He says, this much, as much as they possibly can. He's right. Jesus climbed up on that tree and he stretched his arms out as far as they could go and he said, Whoever finds me, I love you. Jesus loves you. God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that if you would believe in him, 
you would not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you believe in him today? Let's pray about that right where you are. Place your faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that those who know Jesus Christ would be encouraged by his love today, strengthened by his love, that you would walk in his love, manifest his love, make known his good news to others. And let's in this time shine the light of Christ wherever we go. But right where you are, again, one-on-one with Jesus, just as Nicodemus was. He's had this conversation with you today. Would you place your faith in him? Not through these words, but from your heart to God's heart. Just pray something like this. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I know I, I need to be rescued. I need to be saved. I cannot save myself. I'm lost without you. My life is hopeless without you. Jesus, I do believe that you loved me and that you sent your son to die on the cross for my sin and that he rose from the grave. That I, so I believe in him. He could save me. Today, Jesus, would you save me? Would you come into my heart? And be my Savior and my Lord today, Jesus. I believe. I thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer, for answering my prayer, for saving me today. Now let me walk in that light and live in the new life I have in you from this moment forward, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. So if you've made a decision, you prayed that prayer, or you'd like to talk to someone about what it means to know the Lord, we'd love for you to communicate with us. You can do that by going to connect at bsfbc.org. Or by texting BSFBC to that, that number, 31996. We would love to hear from you about what God's doing in your life. Maybe you just want to share a word of encouragement. Or maybe you just have, so you want to talk about baptism, what it means to be a member. Or become a part of this fellowship where you can find a home and find family and find purpose here at Bowling Springs First Baptist Church. We'd love to hear from you today. Again, I hope you have a wonderful day in the Lord. God is great all the time. God bless you. What an incredible word from our pastor this morning. Uh, What we want to do is we believe that every time the gospel and every time God's word is open, there's a chance for you to respond. And right now, if you've made a decision for Jesus this morning through an online format, you don't have to be alone. There are two ways that you can let us know about that so that we can connect with you and help you to take your next steps in your journey of faith. Right now, you can send us an email at connectedbsfbc.org. Or you can shoot us a text message. You can text the word BSFBC to 31996. And someone from our staff will reach out to you first thing tomorrow. Again, thank you so much for joining us today for Online Church. And we'll see you right back here next week.